Good morning. Today I will be reading Luke 10, verses 38 through 42. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked the Lord, Don't you care that my sister has let me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed, or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. If you're going to stumble, you might as well follow it up with something graceful, right? <laughs> up to this point, Jesus has told Theophilus some pretty amazing things. He set out to write the Gospel of Luke to one guy, this guy named Theophilus. Don't really know who he was other than he was a Roman possibly a high-ranking Roman official. And think about what Luke has already told him. He's told him about an incredibly miraculous catch of fish. He's told him about raising a little girl from the dead. He's told him about calming a fierce storm on the Sea of Galilee. He's told them about after calming that storm when they got to the other side about casting a legion of demons out of a guy that could rip chains apart and was probably one of the scariest people they'd ever seen. This is all the stuff that Luke has shared with Theophilus. But then he tells him about this. A couple of sisters having an argument. And Theophilus, as he's reading this for the first time, has got to be shaking his head and saying, Luke, buddy, where are you going with this? What does this have to do with anything? What, 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 what is this all about? We're going to get into that here in just a little bit. But this morning, what we're going to see through this story about Martha and Mary and Jesus is that Martha had a choice and every single one of us has a choice every day that we live. We have a choice to choose what is better. So before we get into that, let's go to God in prayer together. Father God, thank you so much for the wonderful rain that you've blessed us with. We pray that it has been received gladly and that it is a blessing to everyone. We pray that everyone that is receiving it is, is safe. We pray that it will be a blessing upon this beautiful earth that you've created. Father, not only are we thankful for the rain, we're thankful for every blessing that you give us. We're thankful for everything. And there's not any way that we could possibly thank you for everything that you've given us individually. But we recognize what your word says, that every good and perfect gift comes from you. Father, I ask that you would pour down a blessing upon our country. We're going through some very difficult times. And these times are being driven by disagreement, being driven even in some cases by hate. And you sent Jesus into this world to bring people together. In fact, the last thing that he prayed before going to the cross was, Father, may they be one as we are one. He's talking about believers. And if healing is going to come to this country and to this world and to this community, it must start with believers. You've called us to be the salt and to be the light. Give us the courage and the strength and the love to do that. 
This message this morning, Spirit, I pray is your message, that you will speak powerfully to us through this message, that we will understand in a very real way what it means to choose what is better. There's so many things can, competing for our attention. Help us to see through all the, all the rocks and the sand and the gravel and the things that cloud our vision, all the mud to see you, and to always choose you in what is better. Lord, we love you, we thank you, we praise you in this and so many things, in Jesus' name, amen. When you look at this passage that Eli read just a moment ago, it is very, very easy on the surface to come away with the feeling that Martha's the bad guy here. And here's the deal, ladies. Most women know better. You know better. You know better because you can identify completely with Martha. And when we dig deeper, what we see and what she intended, Martha did a really good thing. There's two very important things here about Martha that we really can't miss. First... She opened her home to Jesus and the twelve. Jesus had come to Bethany. Let me tell you something. When Jesus went anywhere, everybody knew it. When Jesus went somewhere, there was a crowd that always went with him. And Martha opened her home to him and the twelve. And again, you can be certain that anywhere that Jesus went, there was a sizable crowd that was in tow. But let's assume for just a minute that it's just Jesus and the twelve that she's bringing into her home. You see, Martha knows that in order to feed the twelve plus Jesus, thirteen, it was going to take a lot of food. It was going to require a lot of her time. And it was going to exhaust a lot of her supplies. And yet she opened her home to Jesus and the twelve. And she demonstrates a gift that we're very, very quickly losing in our society. She demonstrates the gift of hospitality. Second, she was committed to honoring and serving Jesus. Martha was no slouch, okay? She was no slouch. She was a hard worker. She saw a need And worked hard to meet that need. She knew that Jesus and the twelve would be hungry. And so she wanted to be a gracious hostess. Now something that we have to remember, family, is that she couldn't just run out to Walmart and pick up some kosher meat trays and some unleavened bread. She couldn't do that. Neither could she call up little Caesars. Kind of appropriate. Caesar ruled the world, right? She couldn't call up little Caesars and order up some pizza to be delivered to her house. She could not do that. She was going to have to make it happen on her own. She was working hard to honor the Lord in her service. She was trying hard to do what she thought was the best thing, and give the best that she had to the Lord. But in the process, what we see, family, is that Martha was missing the best thing. Look at what Luke tells us about Martha. First in verse 40, we're told that she was distracted. Luke writes, Martha was distracted with much Serving. Take a good look at that. Ladies, have you ever been there before? It's okay. You can say amen, ladies. Have you ever been there before? The word that Luke uses there literally means to be drawn around or to be wrapped around something. Today, we would say that she was all tied up in knots or she was all wrapped up in what she was doing. Martha was so consumed 
with the details of preparing a physical meal in the kitchen that she was missing the opportunity to partake of the spiritual feast that was taking place in her living room. Martha was so enthralled with the details of entertaining her guests that she had no time to enjoy her Lord. The Creator, think about it for just a second. The Creator of the heavens and the earth is sitting in her living room. And she's spending all of her time in the kitchen. Jesus was breaking the spiritual bread that, that she and everybody else needed in the living room. And she's in here running around with flour on her face and, and a big dust cloud of busyness trying to bake physical bread in the kitchen. What we see here is the trivial things were distracting her from the important things. Have any of us ever been there? That may be where you find yourself this morning here in the auditorium and joining us online. You can relate to Martha right now. But here's the thing. Not only was she distracted, she was distressed. You know, a lot of times those things go hand in hand. She was distracted and she was distressed. She's distracted and she knows that she's distracted. She's working in the kitchen when she wants to be listening in the living room. But she has an obligation. She has an obligation as a hostess. And the tension between her obligation and the hunger in her heart to sit at the feet of Jesus is pulling her in two different directions. She can feel it. And in the middle of Jesus' teaching, she reaches a breaking point in the kitchen. And she can't take it anymore. And she expresses her frustration to Jesus. She was tired. She was upset. She needed help in the kitchen. And finally, she loses her composure. Let me tell you something. There's not a woman in this audience or online joining us right now that hasn't been where Martha is. And finally, she loses her composure. That's it. She's had it. You know, I can imagine Martha venting her frustrations. You know, before she finally loses it. I can imagine her venting her frustrations in the same way that many of all of us do, fellows included, when we get upset. She may have sighed <sighs> loud and often. She may have rattled a few dishes in the kitchen. Possibly even slammed a few cabinet doors. She may be grumbling to herself under her breath, just loud enough for everybody to hear, but not quite so loud enough for anybody to really know what she's saying. You ever been there? You ever heard that? Oh, yeah. You know, I can imagine that Martha is sending all kinds of indirect messages in the most direct way that she can possibly think of at this time. But her messages weren't getting through. Nobody was noticing. And finally, she's had it. That's it. And in verse 40, she comes out of the kitchen. And she says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself Tell her to help me. Have you ever had a couple of little girls? I have. This is a flashback. But that's what it looks like, right? That's what Martha sounds like. And here's the deal. The word that Luke uses here, here indicates that she didn't just walk into the room. 
She didn't just stroll into the room, into the living room from the kitchen, or come quietly to Jesus. The word that Luke uses here communicates in the original language that she bursts into the room and she totally unloads on Jesus. In other words, she blows up. She loses her cool. She storms into the room where Jesus is teaching and vents her frustration. And here's the thing. We all know what happened. Because at one time or another, we've all been there. We've been on one or the other side of this situation. We've all been there. Theophilus has been there too. As he's reading this, this, I can imagine that Theophilus is remembering some sort of a similar situation in his own life. We've all been there. Theophilus has been there. And I have to wonder, did Theophilus say to himself, why is Luke telling me this? Here's why. Because this is what really makes Jesus real. As we're going to see, Jesus handles this situation perfectly. What this shows us is how Jesus deals with human nature. Yeah, he's, he's calmed the storm on the sea. He's cast the demons out. He's raised the little girl from the dead. He's overseen and caused the great miraculous catch of fish that caused Peter and James and John to say, hey, that's it, buddy. I'm walking away from everything I've ever known, and I'm following this guy. Luke has already told him about all that. What Luke tells Theophilus here is the real world of human nature. We all know what it's like to be Martha, don't we? When our life starts running us, you know when that happens? You been there? When our life starts running us, instead of us running our life family, when that happens, we start taking it out on those around us. Martha is mad. And it appears she may be mad at Jesus. She's mad at Mary. It appears she may even be mad at Jesus. She's feeling underappreciated and she's feeling overwhelmed at all that needs to be done. Without question, this had to be an uncomfortable situation. Uncomfortable for Martha. Uncomfortable for Mary. Maybe even to some extent uncomfortable for Jesus. And I can only imagine what the twelve are doing as they're just kind of on the periphery. What expressions are on their face? What's going through their minds? It's uncomfortable. It's a tense situation to be in. And in this uncomfortable situation, Jesus takes the time and he sees an opportunity to teach Martha some important truths. In verses 41 and 42, Jesus compassionately responds to her by saying, Martha, Martha, you're worried and upset about many things, but there's only one thing that's needed. Mary has chosen what is better. And it will not be taken away from her. Now take a good look at that. Martha's just thrown a fit. Okay? She's just thrown a fit. Justifiable to some degree, but she's thrown a fit. Like a little girl. Make her help me. Jesus says, no. She's made the right choice. Jesus didn't give anything there. Jesus told it the way that it was. Mary has made the right choice. She has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And what he's telling Martha in the big picture of things is this. He's saying, you know, Martha, maybe 
we really don't need a feast here. Maybe what we really need is just a little snack, okay? And then come join us. Maybe he's saying, Martha, you're so wrapped up in the details that you're missing the most important thing. You're so frustrated, Martha, about baking physical bread that you're missing out on the spiritual bread. When you think about that, Jesus draws us back to his words in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 in the Sermon on the Mount. Remember what he said. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus says in Luke chapter 10, verse 42, that Mary understood that. Mary sees the big picture. Mary understands what's going on. And instead of running around in the kitchen and, and worrying about things that won't last, she has taken a seat at his feet. To listen to what he's got to say. And for her, for Mary, nothing else was more important than Jesus. She knows the difference between the major things and the minor things. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? What does it mean for people in the world that are running around just like Martha trying to figure it all out, putting all of their time, all of their motion, all of their energy into things that won't matter? Family, we live in a world today where people are involved in things. Our children are involved in sports and band and music lessons and gymnastics and church activities and mom and dad are involved in trying to get ahead at work and in the community, and all these different things, and it's in the middle of all this activity, family, that many times we miss out on a real relationship with one another and with our children. And all the busyness that comes with a life that's seeking to keep pace with the world, it's really, really easy to forget the priorities that we live for to begin with. There's an old object lesson that most of you know. <clears throat> and it begins with one of those big five-gallon plastic jars or glass jars, usually plastic. You know the ones I'm talking about. They're the ones that are full of cheese balls right when you walk into Walmart. And you walk in and you see this massive jar of cheese balls and you think, man, that's a good deal. Most guys go there. Wow, man, big, big thing of cheese balls, only five bucks. Well, I'll grab that. And here you go, walking with your buck, you know, a big thing of cheese balls. And you take it home, and the first thing your wife says, you know what, you might get through a third of that before it spoils and goes stale. And that's usually the case. But you know what you do then is you take that thing and you dump out the two-thirds of cheese balls that are just stale and hard as a rock, right? But you save the jar. The object lessons involves that jar, and you take rocks about the size of your fist, and you start putting them in the jar. I want you to visualize this in your mind. I've got that jar, the empty jar, and I'm putting rocks about the size of my fist into that jar, and I fill it all the way to the top. Let me ask you a question. Is that jar full? The answer is no. So then I get a bag of pea gravel, jar's getting heavy now, but that's okay. And I'm pouring pea gravel into that jar. Pea gravel with the big rocks all the way to the top. Is that jar full? It looks pretty full, but it's not. So then I get a bag of sand, and I start shaking sand all in that big, this jar is getting really heavy by now. Fill it all the way to the top with sand. Is that jar full? Some people say no. Some people are like, mm, looks pretty full to me because I'm imagining this big jar that used to have Cheetos in it that's full of rocks and gravel and sand. But let's assume that it's not full. Get a pitcher of water. This jar's getting heavy. 
I pour water on the top of that thing. In fact, I just have to sit it down. Just, I just sat it down right here, okay? And I'm pouring water into that jar. And it starts filling in the little gaps between the grains of sand and the gravel and the big rocks. And it goes all the way to the top. And again, you can see the air bubbling out of the top because the water is forcing out everything. And then it just kind of starts to billow and flow over the top of that jar. I ask you, is that jar full? Yeah, it's full. It is full and it is heavy to carry around. Family, that jar represents your life. And the big rocks that went in first represent our relationships. The big ones with God, with our spouse, with our children, with our family and with our church family. The gravel and the sand and the water represent all the other things. All the other things in this life that get in the way and cloud our vision of the things that are the most important. But like it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you accept it or not, the gravel and the sand and the water is a part of your life jar that you carry around. And here's the thing, and don't miss this. The point is not to cram so much into our life jar that we can fit in. Or work harder to put more stuff in. Family, the object is is to see the things that are most important in our life. The point is, if we don't put the rocks of God and our spouse and our children and our family and our church family in first, then we're never going to get them in. And if we're not deliberate, if we're not deliberate about the best things in life, then we'll find our lives uh, clouded. We'll find our lives crowded by the gravel and by the sand and the water to the point that there's no room left for the rocks. Fame of the best things in life are the things that will be important at the end. When our life comes to an end, I can promise you, I will not find anybody in this room or joining us online that will say, man, I know I'm dying. I know I've got maybe a few hours left, but man, I sure do wish I'd worked harder. Man, I know the end is coming. I sure do wish I'd pumped another 5% into that 401k. Now, that's not going to be important. We're not going to wish that we had run ourselves ragged or accumulated more stuff. In fact, I can promise you that at the end of your life, you can be pretty sure that your children will wish that you had accumulated less stuff, that you had shared more time, and that you had made better memories. In the end, the only things that matter, brothers and sisters, will be the faith that we have nurtured, and the time that we have shared with those that we love the most. In our scripture this morning, Mary and Martha both had a choice to make. They had the choice to choose what is better. They had the opportunity to choose the rock of Jesus Christ or get caught up in the clutter, the gravel, the sand, and the water of less important things. Mary chose what's better. She chose Jesus. And even though Martha at this time, in the scripture reading this morning, at this time chose lesser things, we see later in the story that she changed. And she grew from her frustration in the kitchen. 
when their brother Lazarus died, in John chapter 11, verse 27, family, it was Martha who ran to Jesus and said these words, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who was to come into the world. And family, I believe that Martha learned from that time in the kitchen. And because of her faith, Jesus gave her her brother back. You see, Martha finally understood the difference. She finally understood what so many of us have missed and continue to miss to this very moment. And so many people around us are missing. Martha finally got it. She finally realized the difference between choosing the best things in life over the pressing things in life. She made the choice to choose that which is better. She chose to follow Jesus. What about you this morning? Do you find yourself relating just a little too much to Martha right now? Will you choose to follow Jesus first? So that everything else in your life can fall right into place as it should. And what does following Jesus look like? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. Following Jesus means that we don't follow ourselves anymore. Following Jesus means that you're ready to say, hey, I'm going to put you at the top of my life. I'm going to make you the King and the Lord and the Savior of my soul. Following Jesus means that just as He died for us, that we're willing to die for Him. And aren't you glad we don't have to go get nailed to a cross in order to do that? At least not physically. We do that symbolically. And if you've ever read Romans chapter 6, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You see, Paul tells the Romans that when we die to ourselves, when we're baptized into Christ, we go to our symbolic cross. We're buried with Jesus in that water that represents His blood. We go in a dead soul. We're buried with Jesus. His blood cleanses us of our sins. And we're joined with the Holy Spirit of God. We're united with Him, Paul says. And then when we come up out of the water, we're resurrected to a new life. Paul tells us that as well. And then when we walk out of the baptistry, we're walking as a new creation. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Is that where you are this morning? Is that what you need to do? If so, we're ready if you are. We would love to experience that with you. If you're ready to confess Him as Lord, and die to yourself, and live forever, we want to experience that with you. Maybe you're here this morning and you're looking for a church home. There's a lot of places you can choose, but none of them are perfect, and neither are we. But we'll love you the very best that we can. If you're looking for a church home, I hope you found it, because we want you here with us at Mesquite Church of Christ. If you need us to pray with you and pray for you, that's what the family of God is for. We want to do that. Whatever your need this morning, please.